Je vais vous parler de la position des acteurs I'm going to discuss the position of social actors in the face of biodiversity. Who are the most important stakeholders, those who can really make a difference and lastingly change the momentum in biodiversity? To answer this question, there are three ways of approaching the issue. The first one is to wonder how societies function. It's a highly complex question, which, um, strangely enough, has not been the subject of much research. Recently, a philosopher remarked that a whole pain of philosophy should be developed around the philosophy of societies. How societies function means knowing what their morphology is, from the local to the global level, from the global to the local level. What are the interactions between the state, corporations and civil society? In terms of this question, there are two radically opposed visions. The first one is the position chosen by international conventions, uh, first and foremost among these the Paris Accord, where there are experts who know everything, know how human societies function and can change the rules in order for the operations to change lastingly, in order to reduce climate change, for instance, or to preserve biodiversity. The metaphor is that of the uh, che of chess, where the experts understand the interactions and therefore place their pawns in order for the game to go the way they want. The other vision of the operation of society is the metaphor of the elephant, considering that human society is extremely complex and that any expert, however smart, however knowledgeable, can only see a very small part of the system. It's a, what is known as perspectivism. Each state, each company, each player can only understand a very small part of the system and the momentum of the system as a whole, of the planet as a whole, is the result of a, a complex set of interactions between the states, between the masses, the people, the seven billion human beings, or the, what is known also as the multitude. Another way to approach the issues of biodiversity is to wonder how the momentum in society emerges, who gives the impulse, is it the states? Is it uh, the private market? Is it environmental NGOs who make a difference, who change the momentum? Or even more pragmatically, in terms of the markets, between producers and consumers, who holds the most power? Is it the producers who impose uh, to consumers what they are going to consume because they only offer a limited choice of products? Or conversely, is it consumers who, when they change their preferences, impose a whole set of modifications to the producers? And that would seem to be the case currently in the food system, although, of course, all of these players interact, interaction on the level of governments and then voters. Voters impose change within government and then the governments impose change themselves, legally, but they remain at the mercy of uh, voters and citizens. So there's a whole system of interactions where the influence of each player is very difficult to determine and everyone can actually make a difference, especially if they know where they stand. They can have an idea of the limitations of their own possibilities, but also what the possibilities are with a more or less intelligent interaction between stakeholders. There can also be coalitions, for instance, the uh, short circuits or community supported agriculture are coalitions of producers and consumers. The third manner in which to envision the issue of social players in the face of uh, the problems of biodiversity is to wonder what has changed as a result of climate change or the deterioration of biodiversity. In that sense, one can say that until now we would negotiate with nature, we would develop human activity to the detriment of nature, and everyone was very happy because it provided additional income and benefits. 
But where the momentum in societies becomes radically different is that you can no longer negotiate with nature. Nature has its limitations, and the 7 billion human beings are perceiving these limitations. Based on that, negotiation between the stakeholders becomes much more difficult, because they can no longer expand to the detriment of nature. So now we cannot negotiate with nature, and that has major impacts in many aspects. Three consequences. The first one, what is the possible extent of merchant activities versus non-merchant activities, common services, which are environmental in nature, ecosystemic environmental regulation systems, climate regulation, the quality of water and air, or pollination, which are services that are outside the scope of the market? How can societies make choices between merchant activities to exploit nature, such as agriculture or mining, and how they can balance that out with non-merchant activities, such as environmental regulation services? How can there be a better man management of uh, the commons? Second social question that emerges, it's that of inequality, north-south inequality until recently Northern countries developed their consumption by transferring their uh, most polluting activities towards uh, countries in the south. Now countries in the south are also striving to preserve biodiversity and uh, showing much more concern for climate change. And in the same way, in wealthy countries, social inequality is also reflected in the fact that the poorest, the most vulnerable, are also those who are the most exposed to environmental deterioration. And third aspect of this uh, question of the actors, it is the uh, carryover effect. When one develops increased consumption, um, for the poorest populations, for instance, to balance out levels, this uh, carryover effect becomes very difficult because the planet is, uh, become, is starting to be saturated and there is not that much activity, new activity that can be developed in ecosystems uh, that can be uh, leveraged without damage to humankind.